and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Forensic Psychology. So November is a really important month because on the 19th of November we have International Men's Day and the 2nd of November is uh, Awareness Day around male victims of domestic violence. And in honour of that, we are very privileged to have Dr Elizabeth Bates join us this, uh, for this episode. So Dr Bates joined the University of Cumbria in January 2011 and is currently Principal Lecturer in Psychology and Psychological Therapies within the Institute of Health. Liz's doctoral work focused on exploring the personality and psychopathological predictors of men's and women's partner violence. Since 2012, she has focused her work on exploring the experiences of male victims of domestic abuse. Liz is also a trustee of the charity Mankind Initiative, a UK-based charity supporting male victims of domestic abuse, and is chair of the Male Psychology Section of the British Psychological Society. So Liz, you're very welcome to our episode today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and just to kind of get started, can you tell us a little bit about what your journey was into forensic psychology? Uh, yes, so thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so my journey into forensic psychology, well, I started um, doing my psychology degree uh, because I didn't know what else I wanted to do at the time. Um, and so I just sort of fell in love with the subject while I was doing my degree. And then my interest in domestic violence started in uh, my third, like I can remember very clearly in my third year. Um, and Professor Nikki Graham Kevin, who became my PhD supervisor further down the line, um, she was doing a lecture about women's violence and talking about how women were violent in relationships. And I was just so, um, I remember thinking, I had no idea that that was a thing and that that happened. And so the more that we had to do like an assessment on it, so we did loads of reading and stuff. And um, the more that I read about it, the more I realised that it was this hidden topic and that people weren't really talking about it and that there was all this... Um, all these men that were being abused and not getting help and support with it so it became something that kind of started from there um, and I went on to do my master's dissertation and then my PhD in the area uh, looking at kind of my my work to start with was looking broadly at men's and women's violence with a, a goal of kind of highlighting prevalence and the, the overlap that exists between the two but then after I got my doctorate yeah I started focusing much more on uh, male victims and um, working with mankind and then kind of um specialising a little bit more in that area really so I teach a bit as well um, in psychology at the university um, across the years that I've been there I've taught quite a bit around violence and violent behaviour as well so yeah it's become a, a real passion of mine I think that the topic is um, I mean it's obviously really interesting and everything but it's just so important to talk about because there's just been historically so little awareness of it that the more we talk about it the more I know changes can happen and action can be taken and I've certainly seen that in the last 10 years that I've been working in the area. I'll ask you a question is it, what's the sort of theory or research behind why it's been such a hidden topic? I mean I think we can all have a sort of general sort of view of that but I was thinking is there is there something that that really stood out for you about why it's so hidden? Um, That's a good question I lecture about this quite a lot actually because the history of where we we start talking about domestic violence generally I think is quite a key point in that so uh, pre-1970s it wasn't really something that we talked about at all you know regardless of the gender of the victim or perpetrator but then in the 70s onwards the feminist movement and the women's liberation movement took violence against women up as an issue that they were fighting um fighting against, you know, along with fighting against gender inequality and male privilege and things. So I think that because a lot of that research to start with really originated out of a movement that was heavily gendered in its focus because they were they were focusing on protecting women and wanting to get help and support for women. And I think without that movement, we wouldn't talk about it like we do now. So there's so much credit to be done to that movement in terms of us knowing and understanding what we do about domestic violence now. But because of that, I think that it kind of the way we started talking about it then created stereotypes that men were perpetrators and, and women were victims. And this is despite the fact that we've got sort of historical references to men's victimization. Um, some of the uh, there's a post Renaissance custom called the Charivari um, that's dated obviously a long, long time ago. That was um, a public punishment for any man that had allowed his wife to beat him. So there was there's like recognition that this has been mentioned and talked about before, but it has remained quite hidden. So I think that um, because of the way in which we started talking about domestic violence, 
Um, it, it fed into models and stereotypes that focused very heavily on gender. And then that has become the dominant um, paradigm within uh, policy and practice, despite there being a different body of evidence suggesting that there are a real range of victims, including male victims and victims within the LGBTQ plus community as well. So I think it's it's historically had to do with where the movement started. And I think if, if I was being honest more recently, there are political elements to it as well, I think. <clears throat> How do people sort of find it that you're female doing this research and and chair being a chair of the male division? I mean, how do people respond to that? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that in some ways, because I'm a woman, um, it's easier to talk about uh, men's issues in some ways. Um, I know that it's quite interesting because there's a real mix of reactions. The, for me, the most important ones are the men that I have um, worked with in terms of my research. Any man who's ever read anything that I've written and then felt that they weren't alone. And when they get in touch and say how important it is that they mm -hmm. feel like they'd be believed if they you know, came forward and that sort of stuff. That's really important to me. Um, what I try and kind of engage in less is the... I sometimes get badged as being like a men's rights activist or kind of engaging in that sort of um, political gendered continuum in that way, which I kind of just don't engage in because I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not a men's rights activist in that way. So I think it's, I get a real mixed reaction. Um, and I think the fact that I'm female sometimes helps and maybe hinders as well at the same time. And, and Liz, can you tell us a little bit about the prevalence rates that you were talking about earlier between the perpetration of domestic abuse towards males and females? Can you can you talk to us a little bit about what you found in your research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if depending on which statistics you use, you'll see different prevalence rates come out. So if you are looking at purely the um, sort of prosecution and police records, then men are overwhelming the overwhelmingly sorry the perpetrators and um, the crime survey data that we have so the office for national statistics um suggests that one in three victims are male so that equates to i think last count around seven hundred and fifty seven thousand men um and then if you look at some of the self-report um measures that are used within the wider domestic violence literature when you ask people about the way in which they use um, behaviours within a relationship so not sort of badging it as domestic violence in that way but sort of you know what ask questions about conflict or about how conflict resolution when there's conflict within your relationship and um, some of the act-based measures that are used indicate that it could be even closer to sort of 50 50 in that sense because there's a lot of research suggesting that women and men are using um, relationship violence to roughly similar rates there's been a lot of criticism of some of those measures um, that are used because they're sort of accused of missing context and injuries and things like that. But there's a real range of prevalence data available, basically. But for me, regardless of, you know, whether you use the ONS data or the self-report data, there's a, there's a significant proportion of victims that are, that are male. And is the violence that's perpetrated very similar in the extremes of, um, you know, the extremes of it? that can be seen with males onto females? Yeah, I would say, broadly speaking, there are more similarities than differences. Um, there are some areas, so for example, um, we know that women are killed more um, by partners than men are, although there are still a number of men that um, are killed by partners in domestic homicides. Um, sexual violence is something that we know women experience more, but in terms of the physical abuse, the psychological and emotional abuse, coercive control, we know that there are very, very similar um, experiences so similar like when you look at the qualitative data we look at what people are saying happened it's very very similar um, one thing that I think men um, can experience sometimes more is something called legal and administrative aggression which is um, a, a type of coercive control a type of abuse whereby um, the legal and administrative systems you know within the sector are used as a mechanism of control and so we see that because the system is still so very much set up to see women as victims and men as perpetrators that that sometimes means that women use that system men do it as well don't get me wrong but I think it's something that women are able to do more successfully for want of a better word because of the nature of the systems that we have so it can include things um, like manipulating like family court or making false allegations and things like that. And are there sort of as many resources and agencies available? I've listened to podcasts recently and they were talking about 
um, so much of the funding goes towards it to the other way around, it's females um, as victims. And so when people, um, and the man, it was a man speaker, and he was saying, you know, when I start to ask for funding towards violence towards males, they somehow think I'm anti-females, when obviously it's, that's not the case. They're just trying to ask for um, equality in a way, so, you know, or equity in some way. Um, but it's interesting how it's framed in that way. That's a really good point. I think... Um... I think that's something that I'm always really clear about when I speak about it and when I do conferences or talks to practitioners and things that um, because I want there to be um, more equity and opportunity for men to get help and support certainly does not mean I'm taking I would ever want to take mm. anything away from any women any services that support women and girls particularly because I think broadly speaking the sector in itself you know needs a lot more funding putting into it but pro proportionally um, there are nowhere near the amount of services to support men as, as I say, like the ONS data suggests that like a third of victims are male, but there's certainly not a third of the funding that goes towards supporting men. Those areas are, are chronically underfunded. You mentioned um, the Mankind Initiative um, previously. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's one of the agencies I understand supports male victims of domestic abuse. Yeah, Mankind Initiative is a, a UK-based male victims charity that I'm incredibly proud to work with. Um, they don't re their helpline that they've got it doesn't receive um, government funding; it's run entirely on donations. Um, and so they run the helpline. They um have like a database of uh, resources and contacts, so that if people are wanting to support a male victim in their area, and like practitioner service providers etc., that they have like a database of resources, so they can signpost to local agencies. And they also engage in a lot of um, advocacy work as well in terms of trying to uh, lobby the government in terms of making sure that they're including male victims within policy and practice and legislation as well. Um, their helpline is an anonymous helpline, which I was um, just doing a talk today, actually I was, um, teaching some students today, that the um, the anonymity element of it is really important for men. Um, I think it was I think it was around seventy percent uh, of the men that have called wouldn't call um, if it wasn't anonymous because we, uh, we know that that first level of disclosure, that first stage, sorry, of disclosure, I think that anonymity is really important um to men but they also support like so the helpline also receives call from service providers and also from friends and family members as well that are concerned about men um in their lives and men in their families and stuff so they do a huge amount of work to try and support male victims is there a sense that um these sort of resources are well taken up or is there work to do to sort of get that knowledge out there that there is support and services available that's a really good question. Um, I think that the way in which services work need to be really where they offer services to men need to explicitly offer. And what I mean by that, and it's something Mark, uh, Mark Brooks, who's the chairman of Mankind, he talks about quite a lot, which is that um, because of the nature of the stereotypes and the stigma and stuff that still exists in the area, it's not enough to sort of talk, say something's gender neutral and just to just badge it as domestic violence generally. You, you need to sort of really explicitly say like, we support men too, because otherwise men won't see that, they'll see domestic violence and assume it's, it's not for them. And I think that a lot of, um, it, I do feel like it's changing. Like I said, I've, been, I've worked in the area for about 10 years now. So I do see a shift I think in terms of how we talk about it generally in society, which I think is hopefully impacting um, on men in that way and recognising that. But the literature supports that men struggle to recognise their experience and then struggle to um, disclose and ask for help as well through a, a range of different barriers on sort of personal, social and structural levels as well. And I wonder if that affected your rates of, um, you know, researching into this area. I was thinking, you know, we sort of, set up a research project and you're looking for participants it's not the most easiest thing to I mean you know, granted it's, it's anonymous you know research is, is designed that way but I wondered if it affected your sort of uptake there to even explore the area with others and um, that's that's something I considered quite a lot when I when I did one of my um first bigger studies with male victims and um, that I published in 2020 and um, that was a real uh, sort of um process that I engaged in, in terms of thinking about that and it's why I sort of I'd reviewed the air the literature that was in the area that was qualitatively trying to understand men's experiences and provide 
because a lot of the criticism that had been of this sort of work, like I had done myself, looking at sort of the conflict tactics scale and these act-based measures, they were saying that the context is missing and men just aren't, it's just not impacting on men the same. And I, I knew that wasn't the case. So I was sort of looking at the qualitative based research that there was, and it was either interview based, which requires you to sit. I mean, <laughs> these days we would sit on a computer, but sit sort of ac across somebody and talk about that. Um, to have identified as a victim, which many men struggle to do, or to have already engaged in seeking help, which is again a, a huge barrier to overcome. So they're kind of that's one particular group of men that are there. So I, I wanted to use an anonymous online survey purposefully to try and promote as much anonymity so that it would facilitate more men. Definitely not, you know, the full range. I know that, but more men being able to sort of disclose and I think from um, my first survey that was 161 men and 25 percent of them had never told anybody else it was the first time they told anybody so again it's an imperfect you know scenario it's certainly not a perfect way but I know that I captured more voices within that than other research that might have not given them that kind of protection and that level of safety in, in disclosing. Yes, I was really interested in what you were saying about um, the difficulties men have in coming forward and sharing their experiences. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think with some of the people I've worked with sometimes, they who have been victims of domestic violence, they, they have shared the same and almost they don't see themselves as a victim and almost like, well, that was just her behaviour. She was just acting out, but would never see themselves as a victim of domestic violence or would feel quite shamed about it. Um, and so I don't know, Liz, if that mirrors what your experience or what you found in terms of your research. Um, the barriers that are faced by any victim of domestic violence are really significant and a lot of the early research that looked at women's experiences and started to talk and develop models to understand those barriers talk about um, being a, a victim of domestic violence as being like a stigmatised identity so there is stigma associated still with that um, so we know that there are lots of barriers anyway but for men there are additional barriers um, largely you know that the sector is built in the way that it is which means that the services aren't always visible there are sort of um personal level barriers i would call them in terms of men themselves not recognizing that experience sometimes or um having to overcome other barriers around things like you know the male gender role and masculinity to be able to talk about something like the word victim and being a victim in that way is not it, it, it's synonymous with it's, I mean, it's not synonymous with weakness, but the perception could be that it's synonymous with weakness and that doesn't fit with that male gender role where men are supposed to be big and strong and tough and stoic and to be able to look after themselves. So I think there's lots of barriers that exist around that. There are barriers on what I kind of call a social level, which by which I really mean sort of the fear of the reactions of others. So men fear not being believed or they fear being accused of being a perpetrator. And unfortunately, that's that's what I've seen in some of my research where men like I've there's some horrible stories about men who were laughed at um, who were given who were signposted and given a helpline number. But it was for a batterer program. Um, they've been asked what they did to deserve it, accused of obviously starting it in some way. So there's that fear of that reaction because that plays into all those barriers. And then on sort of a structural and more, you know, systemic, if you will, level, the, there aren't as many resources. So that's a massive issue. But even where there are, they're not always necessarily as visible or they're not necessarily always as, as appropriate either. So I think that there's sort of multiple layers that men um, face in trying to kind of get help and support. And I think sometimes particularly when they're um, victims of female perpetrated violence because of the nature, again, of those stereotypes that says that men are perpetrators and women are victims as well. And it's interesting how society sort of depicts them because often you'd see a sort of a bigger woman and a smaller man being sort of henpecked, I suppose is the word, and you used to see sort of um, postcards, you know, jokey postcards about it. And, and you think, how is society, you know, how grown to develop, to have that view of um, that because it, it wouldn't seem acceptable if it was the other way around and how that's how that can be overcome, really. Yeah, that's a good point. The the still is now uh, men's experience as men's victimization um, at the hands of women is still something that is used sometimes in programs as a tool of humor. Mm. Um, and there's like numerous, there's numerous examples. Um, I always remember that there was one from Friends um, where Joey was going out with a girl who was particularly petite. 
um, and she would hit him and they would laugh and everybody would laugh about it and then you could see he was a baby and all this sort of stuff. And it was, it, you would not say that in the same, you know, like the, I don't like to be the other way around, but you wouldn't see us laughing at women's experiences at the hands of a man in that way. So I think that that's kind of, it plays into a lot of attitudes and the, the attitudes and sort of perceptions based literature that's explored that using like scenarios and vignettes and things says that people see men's violence towards women as much more serious, much more likely to cause injury. Men tend to be blamed more for their victimisation. Uh, women's violence is just not seen as, you know, anything to be concerned about, nothing to necessarily ring the police about. So the the way in which we still can kind of use use that as a tool of humour, coupled with what we know are existing attitudes, again, plays into then all those issues around those barriers. Is there much knowledge out there about um, how um, perhaps women might get onto that pathway of being abusive to partners? Because I guess I was thinking about the research that or knowledge, I think, in programmes and research and what interventions, whatever, what have you, that have been put forward for males as perpetrators. Where, where, is, where is the academia or the practice world in terms of female as perpetrators? Um, the current interventions that we have for domestic violence or certainly the traditional ones that, that, as I said, came out of that early work and those early gendered models. So some of the really Duluth based interventions that see the, you know, the power and control wheel, really they talk about gender inequality and male privilege. And um, that, as I've always said, that it might be applicable for a small group of men that are violent towards women. But the reality is that the research evidence says that that model isn't effective. Um, the research evidence says that there is a huge amount of overlap between, like similarity, I mean, between men's and women's um, risk factors, between the things that kind of lead to this. And it is it includes things like early childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences, like a lot of those factors that we know now more with the research that's going on now and with the trauma-informed approaches for men is much more effective at tackling and reducing reoffending and, and violence again. It's 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 similar for women. There is this similar levels of abuse and trauma in their histories and in their pasts. The research has not been done as much with men, sorry, as much with women, beg your pardon, largely because women have been less likely to be prosecuted. So we've not always had the same sort of clinical level sample to kind of work with. But I would say, broadly speaking, there are more similarities than differences between between that. That's what the evidence, the research evidence says. And did you look at people, um, children being um, assaulted by their mothers, for instance, as sort of, or were you looking at only adult men? Yeah, no, so I just worked with partner violence, although um, with my colleague Julie Taylor at the university, we've been looking at um, children's experiences, but kind of working with uh, retrospective accounts from adults about what it was like to grow up in a, in a home where there was violence and abuse, because children historically in that scenario have been um, conceptualised as witnesses um, of abuse, so so it implies that they're passive, that it, they're not an active member of the family, that it's not actually going to impact them on that much. But reconstructing them now more as victims in their own right of, of the abuse that occurs in the home, regardless of whether they are you know, physically assaulted or abused in that way. But recognising that can really sort of um, provide more gateways in theory to be able to get in access for help for them. But the, the data that we've got suggests that the the children that are growing up in these homes are significantly impacted by by the abuse that there is and, and is a child is an adverse childhood experience that then you know is associated with those other right outcomes or certainly an escalated risk for some of those more adverse outcomes and again is that looking at the similarities whether it's the man woman or, or same gender i guess you know is it that there's a sense that the perpetrator the gender of perpetrator is less relevant to the outcomes anyway the outcomes would still be the same or is there going to be sort of research into the differences or? that's a good question the, the data that we, we haven't sort of compared but in the data set that we've got there were um male perpetrators female perpetrators and there was quite a lot of bi-directional abuse as well because i think that that's still something that people that we, we massively underestimate really as a society the extent to which that violence can be mutual or um, there can be victims and perpetrators within the same relationship, whether at the same or different times. So that yeah, I haven't done we haven't done like direct comparisons of that, but from my understanding of the data we've got, I didn't see any any differences. I think that the 
the living in that state of fight or flight, that sort of walking on eggshells, that sense of anticipation, all the time waiting for the next sort of conflict to happen and, and not feeling safe. That that was something seen consistently regardless. I, I was curious, Liz, you know, does or what are the kind of rates of cases where men have been victims of domestic violence going to kind of court and getting a conviction? And is it like I wondered if we, we know anything about that? Because I was curious if it's such difficulty with men coming forward with it. I would assume that the, the rates in comparison to men being convicted of similar offences must be quite lower. But I don't know if that shows in the research or what we know about that. Yeah, I mean, it shows in the crime survey statistics um, that the, the still like the, I think, oh God, I, should, I should have checked before I came on. I think the 80, 90% of perpetrators going through the system are, are male. Um, and we know that, you know, many, many of the perpetrators of men's victimisation are female and of women's victimisation as well are female. And um, so I don't, there isn't, it's not reflected, the, the, the experiences of the men that I've worked with isn't reflected in the number of prosecutions of women that are being abusive, certainly. Um, what I have noticed though is in a project that I did with um, Julian, with a student, um, the student, my, one of my dissertation students led on it actually, and we looked at some domestic homicide reviews um, where it was a male victim and a female perpetrator. So there were 22 across a 10 year period. And what we saw within that was the ways in like so we, we analysed the reports that had come out of that. And what we saw within that was acknowledgement by the, the authors of these reports that there had been missed opportunities to help and support men, including things like not following up with injuries, even though some of the men had you know attended A&E multiple times with injuries. Uh, not questioning the men on their own away from their partner, as we would we do, we would do routinely with women to give them that space to be able to disclose. Um, and there were lots of there were some conclusions as well around that the idea that actually a woman presenting with the same risk and need as the man in those situations would have been treated differently. So I think that there's um, the gap in the numbers of victims and perpetrators that we're aware of with that that stats the sorry the crime survey data and the number of prosecutions is sort of a big gap in the middle whereby we're not still working with men and women in the same way through that process that longer process. It almost seems like there needs to be a way that a man can disclose what's happening to them without them having to label themselves as a victim, because that's often the, the hurdle, isn't it, of seeing what, as you said, society or they might view themselves as being stronger and should be more strong than the person that's doing it to them. And that somehow that's, I mean, lots of men I've worked with would just wouldn't be able to tolerate that label of being a victim. Um, so it's finding another way of actually acknowledging what's happened to them without them having to have that label. Yeah, absolutely. And, and facilitating um, safe disclosure as well. So one of the um, one of the other studies that um, Julie and I did, I should have just brought Julie on the podcast with me. Um, one of the other studies that Julie and I did was um, using something called photo elicitation. So it's um, interviews where you use photos rather than like an interview schedule. And we got uh, men to bring photos along that was talking about their experiences of having, you know, lived with, lived in a domestic, a, de a domestically abusive relationship. And it was really powerful um, images and stuff that they brought that really showed the the grief and the um, trauma of what they'd been through and all the impacts that that was having. But one of the things I really remember from that study was one man telling me um, that there was basically an incident whereby he they'd had to ring. She'd been she'd stabbed him, and they'd had to ring at nine 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 because there was so much blood loss. Um, but then she set up a scene as if it was an accident. She was then with him all the time in the ambulance in the hospital, so he was never on his own. But the doctor who was working with him didn't feel something was right, and so took him away independently. Said, "Look, do you need help?" And actually, that direct question to that man was the first step in him leaving an abusive relationship that he'd been in for years. So like, I think it's not always enough to provide the space for men to talk. Sometimes actually asking those questions is really important because we m much more routinely would ask women, like if women turned up in hospital with injuries, we would ask, and I, and I know that we wouldn't do it the same for men. And I know that men are much more at risk of engaging within violence and becoming victims of violence in a much wider range of settings but we still still should ask, you know, like trust your instinct. If you think there's something wrong and ask is, is something. So I think that there are lots of different things we could do slightly differently to support men with that. And one of the things I was also saying in this lecture I gave today, which was that we work with 
we work to understand the barriers that men face in coming forward and asking for help, but we sort of frame it so much in terms of how can we get men to come and ask for help? And I kind of feel like, why don't we work more and say, well, actually, how can we make these services feel approachable for men what how can we advertise or promote or do something different that means then a man would look at it and think I feel like I could go there so rather than change the man why don't we change what we're doing to make it more inclusive and I is it the same um yeah what what sort of spawn times when you sort of go and have you know when you go and have a baby and they'll say to you even that early check-in stage they almost say come on your own Tell us about your relationship. You know, are there any problems? Yet? They're all they're already thinking, you know, the markers are having children or perhaps leaving relationships. You know, there's times at which perhaps the health services might um, introduce these ideas to to women. And I was thinking, I wondered if that's the same, are these the same risk factors for men? Is it the ending of relationships? Is it the introduction of children? I wonder what the research said and whether health services. I've got some some way to sort of understanding when to ask men about this sort of thing. Well, men's help seeking, their their preferred choice of help seeking, first and foremost, would be informal. So that would be friends and family or going online and looking on the internet for stuff and for help. But their second choice is the family doctor, the second most common choice of disclosure. And there was a study I remember in, in the UK in 2014 that had looked at um, men's experiences of, um, I think, being asked about perpetration or victimisation of domestic violence. And only, uh, I think it was 1.4%, something really, really small, a really small percentage of men had ever been asked within this service. I think it was in the southwest of England. It, only that very tiny proportion of men had ever been asked if they'd experienced domestic violence. So we don't ask, we don't promote that. Um, the the thing you, you raise about the pregnancy is quite interesting because I don't it's there's not a lot of literature looking at the way in which men's experiences might be around that sort of factor although there is I am engaged in something at the moment where I'm trying to sort of find the answer to that but we see that um, in my data a lot of them talk about when she was pregnant it was it either it, it, the pregnancy can sometimes be a trigger so it's either that it got worse when she was pregnant or it stopped for a bit because she was pregnant like it, it is it has been a factor for some men but even when we look, think about stuff like the dash risk assessment one of the questions on there is are you pregnant to the women so you're already starting men at minus one in terms of being able to get to that high risk threshold where they would have access to idvas and stuff so actually what you see is that some people will just skip that question whereas others will turn it around and say what you know is your partner pregnant because that could also then be a risk factor so i think there's there's it's interesting that you you raise it like that because there's lots of things i don't think we're kind of doing where that's again a good opportunity where we could kind of introduce those conversations and just because people might not know do you want to say um what an idva is um, so it's an independent domestic violence advisor and they work with high risk victims so people that score above 14 on the dash risk assessment and they support them in terms of um you know the support that they might need like it was introduced originally in the us um the advocacy system to support women who didn't want to leave the relationship or leave the home but sort of supported them with safety planning and crisis management and stuff like that so it's it's kind of somebody that's a specialist in terms of being able to um, support victims although now you've brought that up um the iris system around that is part of the gp um system in the uk might be england or wales actually i would need to check that but they have um specific referral pathways for women if women disclose to their gp that they've experienced violence and, and they're victim of domestic violence there are specific referral pathways so they can then be signposted to an idva who will then support them um, but for male victims, there's just signposting and the signposted to other organisations like Mankind and, and other survivor um, organisations. So, again, there's, there's an opportunity where we could do something there, but it, it's just not it's not good enough. And so for you, Liz, what are the next steps for you in terms of your research and, and all the work that you're doing? What are you kind of hoping to go on to next? Um, so I've got a few, well, I've got a few projects um, on the go at the moment. I'm, I'm still really committed to the work that I'm doing in this area. Um, I think probably one of the things that I'm most excited about at the moment is that um, Julie and I have co-edited a book um, about domestic violence against men and boys that is due to come out in December. And it's a, it's purposely we've put it together as a range of like amazing experts that have written chapters in it. But it's not like a textbook textbook. It's It's written because... Part of the issue that I think there is for me is that 
Um, I, don't get me wrong, I, I love publishing in journals and I love being able to publish my research in that way, but so many of the people that need access to the research can't get access to the journals because they're behind paywalls. So one of the things I do is I try and engage much more with sort of service providers and with like social workers, GPs, that sort of thing. I'm trying to kind of engage in disseminating my work in that way to try and raise that awareness. So the book that we've done is very much for, it's not for academics, although I think it would be you know quite good for students and stuff, but it's really for like practitioners, for people working on the front line that want to understand better what we know about men's experiences. So that's something I'm quite excited about at the moment. What would you like to see come out of the um, the sort of the two days that are coming, the men's day and then the highlighted violence games? What would you like to see come out of that? I think any... Any days, any any events, anything where we're talking about male victims is incredibly important for raising awareness because it is still a hidden issue. And um, there's still a range of victim groups that experience domestic violence that are, that remain hidden from sort of the mainstream nar narrative in that way. So I think a really good outcome would be more awareness raising for people um, who are working on the front line and might see men in their practice. Um, for friends and family members who might be worried about a man and, and know something's not right and then might might reach out and try and safely have a conversation or even for men themselves as well. Sometimes um, so many of the men that I've worked with have said that they felt like they were on their own until they'd seen something or read something about it. So I think that if it, it might be able to support and encourage some other men to, to ask for help and to disclose, that would be really important. And I think International Men's Day generally, I think that it's so important for raising issues that do affect men and boys. Um, but also it's a really good opportunity to celebrate the really important contributions men and boys make in a really positive way. There's so much narrative around masculinity that's really toxic and negative and so it's constructed in that way sort of typically so I think it's a really good opportunity to celebrate men and boys and, and what amazing contributions they make. And maybe like you said there's something really systemic about that isn't there even to the even to the education system. Yeah. Even yeah. to what, what we're sort of yeah I, I don't know I there's a gap sometimes to actually get in earlier earlier with some of those attitudes and thoughts and changing some of the culture even. An yeah time. I mean I think it's just like it, it it's there are lots there are lots of issues that I mean I think like mental health and suicide for example we, is a really talked about statistic I think now that men are much more at risk of suicide but there are other things like education and, and school achievements and attainment that um boys do do not experience and, and and certainly don't achieve in the same way sometimes as girls but again that's something that we don't always necessarily focus on but this gives us an opportunity to really kind of pull out and highlight some of these issues that are really negatively impacting on men and boys as well. Um, Salim, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. It's absolutely fascinating to learn about your research. Um, and we'll put links into your research and that book as well that you mentioned for, for our audience. Um, and all that's left to say is let's talk forensic psychology.